Churches like this one and other ones I'm very aware of. And I think hmm, sometimes of course thinking is dangerous. But um, people aren't concerned about the salvation of their souls. Not that I don't get it's about now and how do I get from Monday through Friday? And how do I get through the weekend? And how do I adjust to all the complications in my family? Um, and my aging, or, or my growing, depending on what spectrum you're at. Um, and we take one day to the next, and we, you know, Pastor, I'm just trying to get through one day to the next. But you've got a soul. And the whole point is the church and the message of the gospel is to save your very essence, not just for now, but for everlasting life. It's such a beautiful message, and once you, I think I tried to say this last week, I'm always not sure how well I say it, but when you finally make peace with God, you can make peace in this world, and peace with yourself, knowing that He's got you, and He's got your soul, and your soul will improve as you live daily and daily with Him. You know, in the, the introduction to this message, the Bible is a love story. It truly is a love story. From 30,000 feet, from eternity itself, it's a love story about God's redemption for His creation. We fell. We still fall. The whole story of Israel, and we get to a little bit of that with this today's message coming from Samuel. But did, did the Israelites wander and break away from him and not follow his commands and do crazy things and false idols and immorality and all this stuff that we look at and say, oh my God, how could they do that? We're doing the same thing. The church is doing the same thing. We still wander from his love we do idol worship, call for idol, whatever you want. Immorality is rampant everywhere. Just paint it whatever brush you want. And yet, because it's about us. Yeah, God, you're there, it's fine. Good to know you. I'm glad you're in my life, but I'm going to do my own thing anyway. Hmm. You know, when I say it's a love story, in the greatest sense of the world, it says, the scriptures say a remarkable thing, when we were his enemies, he died for us. We aren't loved because we're lovely. 
Well, love because he wants to love us. It's his will. It's who he is. It's by his nature to love us. Not because we deserve it. And I say it's a love story um, in the biggest way possible. There's also great, great, tremendous, beautiful love stories in the Bible. Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve is a love story. It fell apart, but they were what story? Abraham and Sarah, it's a love story. Moses and Mary and Adam, it doesn't have to be love necessarily between just a man and a woman in that sense of the word. Moses, Adam, and Mary were siblings. They deeply loved one another. And the three of them helped lead that. Everyone gave Moses the credit, but it wasn't for Aaron and Mary. And they don't. Get out, they don't get into the wilderness or get out of it. And they really loved each other. Marion in the Bible was the first woman recorded to lift up a song of praise to God. Marion, Moses' sister. Ruth and Naomi, a love story between a daughter in law and a mother in law, and later on, Ruth and Boaz. It's a beautiful love story and how they found each other. Rachel and Jacob, Rebecca and Isaac, Joseph and Mary, Priscilla and Aquila, Martha, Mary and Lazarus, again these siblings who Jesus loved them so much because they loved one another. Mary, Martha and Lazarus, two sisters and a brother. Lydia, <laughs> the remarkable part about Lydia's love, she loved an unknown gentleman. Any of you love an unknown gentleman or woman? It's okay. The Bible says it's okay. Not everybody's named. The names are left out to protect the innocent. <laughs> but now a beautiful love story about Elkanah and Hannah. Elkanah and Hannah. But before I get to that, before this could ever happen, and the consummation of their love story. Um, there's a king to be had. And we oftentimes we resist kings. We don't like control by one person. Kings. But there were some good kings. And the need for a king in Israel's time, Israel, their brief history, not to bore you, but they had the patriarchs, and they all came along and led the people, and they had the voice of God behind them, and the people listened to them. And the last one was Joshua. When Joshua passed, there were no longer any patriarchs. So judges came into being, the judges. And the power was in the hands of the judges. And you know some of the judges. Some of the judges were Samson, Gideon, Deborah, and Barak. Deborah and Barak together were judges. So you know some of them, and they, they were they were under justice for quite some time. The last judge was Samuel, who was also a prophet, and the king maker. But they needed a king because, like today, you want some relevance for the text? I'm reading old history here. I'm giving you old history. 3,000 years ago, roughly. Because guess what? 3,000 years ago, Israel was still under attack all the time by the Philistines. But it wasn't the Amorites, and it wasn't the Babylonians, it was the Philistines. Today, it's other groups of people that are attacking Israel. So they came to Samuel, who was getting old, and he was a judge, and they said, look, give us a king. But really what they wanted was a commander-in-chief because they had so many maids going to the villages, they were losing people left and right. And no one would stand up coordinated against the Philistines unless they had a king. So the first king was Saul. And Saul was a great man originally. He was great and powerful, great strength. He was a soldier. He could command an army. But politically he was weak. <laughs> he became disillusioned. And after he began to fail, 
Samuel said, I need to anoint a new king. And this is what he did. First Samuel 16, 10 through 13 and 18. <clears throat> Jesse, Jesse was the son of Obed. Obed was the son of Ruth and Boaz, who, who this priest, you'll meet a little bit later, Eli, knew them. So there's a connection here. So Jesse made his seven sons pass before Samuel, because, Je because Samuel knew the blessing of that family. <clears throat> So he wanted to meet Jesse's seven sons. And Samuel said to Jesse, <clears throat> the Lord has not chosen any of these. So Samuel said to Jesse, are all your young men here? He said to him, there remains yet the youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. Just a nobody who came to be somebody, just a nobody, keeping sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in, took a while to get him, he was down tending to the sheep. Still young, David was. Now he was ruddy, bright eyes, good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, and the Lord said to Samuel, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. So Samuel took the horn of the oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. This horn of oil was really virgin olive oil with some, oh, they throw some herbs in there and some other type of minerals and whatnot to make a, a special cocktail, blessed by the prophet and the priest, which Samuel was. And he would bless him with that so everyone could see him. It would be never used again, never used again, one time only, each time they anointed someone. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from, the day, from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. He did his job. Now verse 18, just so you know how the people were overtaken by this. So one of the servants answered and said, Look, I have seen the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who was skillful in play. He was a musician, a mighty man of valor. He was courageous. There's a story that David killed a bear and a lion with his bare hands. A man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person, and the Lord is definitely with him. So Samuel anoints him, and the rest becomes history. He, um, became the greatest king of Israel. He was a benevolent king. Did he have feet of clay? Of course. Did he wander? Of course. Was he still a man after God's own heart? Of course. Was he forgiven? Of course. Did his son inherit the kingdom after him and was also anointed? Yes, Solomon. And that kingdom lasted a good 120, 150 years before Solomon himself had so many sons he didn't know what to do, so he split the kingdom. He split it between the northern kingdom and the kingdom of Judah, and the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and one was led by Moabim, one was led by Jerobim, and after that it got complicated and eventually it weakened, but that's another story. But <clears throat> why is Samuel so blessed to be this kingmaker? What did Paul Harvey say? Now you know the rest of the story, so I'll give you that. I'll give that to you. Remember, this is a love story. Now there was a certain man of Ramaham Zophem, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jerome, 
the son of Elu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zeph, an Ephraimite. So this is backwater country. This is a small town. This is not Bethlehem. Well, Bethlehem was a small town too, backwater town. So was Nazareth. But it wasn't Jerusalem. It wasn't any great city at the time. It was just a small, he was a farmer. A father, a farmer, and a simple man, Elkanah. He had two wives. Now in common those days, don't start going crazy with that. Polygamy often happened. God allowed it only because women needed to take care of it. And the idea of having an heir, having a male son, was so critical to the lineage of the family that if, they, if their first wife couldn't bear that child, they would get out and seek a second wife. Some had concubines, but at least Elkanah had the decency to also make Phenon, you're going to meet in a minute, his second wife. Two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Phenina. Phenina had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up, this man, meaning Hannah, this is important, it'll come in later, this man, Elkanah went up from the city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord host in Shiloh. Shiloh was their place of worship. It's like going to the tabernacle or the temple. They didn't have temples then, they had tabernacles, which were big tents, but it was a sacred place. So he'd go up to Shiloh and he'd make his offerings to the Lord. Also the two sons of Eli, and Eli is the priest, Hophni and Phinehas, priests of the Lord were there as well. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Phineas, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah. For he loved Hannah. When I first read that, I wondered, did he love her because it was lip service? Did he love her because he felt sad for her and bad for her. The text says he loved her, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival, who was Phanina, also provoked her severely to make her miserably, miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. Another reason I love the Word of God so much in the Bible, it tells us the truth. Phanina was a nasty woman. Phanina was venom to even their marriage. She probably wanted that marriage between Hannah and Elkanah to break up. She was a terrible person, maybe a lot younger. Maybe she did end behind because she knew in her heart that, if, that Elkanah really loved Hannah and not her, and she couldn't stand it, so she kept... You know how people do that in life? It's so sad to make themselves look better in the front of other people, and they can't really do it. So what they do is try to bring you down. They try to make you look worse. They try to needle you. They try to offend you. They try to tease you, criticize you. Anything they can do to make you look worse in the sight of others. And that's exactly what Fia and I was doing. What did Elkanah do about it? What did he do about it? Nothing. He didn't want to get involved. How does that sound? Leave me alone. I don't want to get in that mess between two women. <laughs> Having their argument, right? So it was year by year, when she went up, now she goes up, this is important, to the house of the Lord, and she goes by herself, that she provoked her Therefore she wept and did not eat. That's Hannah who wept and did not eat because she was so beside herself with what was happening and her husband who said he loved her so much didn't do anything about it. Didn't call Phinehas into it and say, well, you gotta stop this, you gotta stop it, but no more offerings for you and out will you go and your kids, but he didn't do that. Most men are weak. Most men are weak. 
not in the sense of having battles, but many times, I'm not being critical, but in today's society, I'm being a little bit critical. They're weak when it comes to holding the home together. Hold the house together. Hold the family together. Of course families will fight and disagreements, but you need strong, able-bodied men and women. But the heroine of the story is Hannah, and she's coming up. So Elkanah, her husband, this is verse 8, says to her, oh, Hannah, why do you weep? This is his solution to the problem. <laughs> Yeah, maybe he had some charisma, maybe he was good looking himself, I don't know. Why don't you eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better than your ten sons? Hey, look, you got me? What are you so worried about? Uh, Hannah is saying, you don't get it, buddy. You don't get the depth of my problem. You don't understand that my, my destiny and my role in life is to have a son. There's other destinies and other roles, but he just felt, look, you've got me, what are you worried about? So Hannah rose after they had finished eating and drinking, and she goes to Shiloh, which is the place of worship. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. So that's the worship place. <clears throat> so she was in bitterness of soul, prayed to the Lord, and wept in anguish. She's destroyed. She's destroyed. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the afflictions of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, and I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and the razor shall not come upon his head. Basically what she was saying was, you're going to take care of the Lord, not me. He's going to be yours. This, this, in some cases, some commentators, commentators, commentators will give some similarities to this birth in a very human way to the similarities of Mary giving birth to Christ. This and let Samuel become a linchpin for the nation of Israel. If it wasn't for Samuel and what he would become, which she would give birth to. Samuel was the bridge between the judges and the kings, and that bridge made it possible for the kingdom of Israel to happen because of Samuel's commitment to the Lord. And it happened that she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli watched her mouth. This is a great moment in the text, isn't it? Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk. Where have we heard that before? In the Bible. Pentecost. They're drunk. No. They were grieving in the spirit. They were blessed by the Spirit. She was so into the Spirit. She was speaking in her heart, and the mouth was moving, but Eli couldn't even hear it. Of course, we find out later that Eli was kind of deaf. True, true. Couldn't see that well either. So Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I'm a woman of sorrowful spirit. I am not drunk. Neither wine nor any intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Has that ever happened to you? You've poured out your soul. I know about lip service to God. I know about paying attention to God. But I don't know if you could say, I could admit it a couple of times, where I've really poured out 
myself. And it works. You have to be genuine. She was so genuine. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. I'm being sincere with you. And you know, there's something about saying this to yourself, and I, I know what I am. A few times in my life, meaning that in my position as a pastor, a few times in my life I've had the privilege, and I say it's a privilege, that people come to me and pour their hearts out to me. They pour their hearts out to me, ask for special prayers about special situations they're going through, and you can never think that that's not important. You can never belittle them for what they, you might think, well, what do you mean? Just put a band-aid on it. No! It's really a critical problem. It could be your own child who might come to you with the same thing, or your own grandchild. We need to listen. And if you're in a position of having that authority, and someone comes to you and pours out their soul to you, and if it's not a pastor, it could be a good friend, or you might have a friend you can go to and do the same thing. Have it. And they, they listen to you and respond. And finally, Eli got it. He did get it, as old as he was. And his corrupt, Eli, well, he came from the lineage of Aaron himself. Eli was a deserving priest, but he was just getting old. What did they say, long in the tooth at this time? Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked him to do. And this would happen. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. So that whole experience lifted her up. She felt new lease on life. She felt this something could happen. Now this next verse is very critical. Then they rose. Now who's they? They is Elkanah, her husband, and Hannah early in the morning and worship before the Lord. Do you see that in verse 19? Keep looking at that. They rose early in the morning and worshiped. Before that time, they had never worshiped the Lord together. Elkanah would go to Shiloh himself. He would say, say to the ladies, don't worry, I'm taking care of the offering. I got it all covered. You can stay at home. I'll take care of it. Men, in that time, it was customary. Men and women did not worship together. Jewish men did not worship with Jewish women. They were separate. And she'd go by herself. But watch what happened after Eli. I don't know the whole, they gave us that part of the conversation, but Eli somehow, she knew what to do and she knew what she'd do. She took her, she knew what to do. She took her husband by the hand and they went together and worshiped together. Amen. And I know from that point on that she knew it, that God blessed and consecrated their marriage. And what happened? And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. I don't have to say any more, right, church? Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. And the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the process of that time that Hannah conceived and bore a son, and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked for him from the Lord. He blessed that union, because finally they were together on the same page with the Lord, and nothing was being torn apart, and she gave him the gift of Samuel. And Samuel, at the age of, they think, 12 or 13, Got a message from the Lord. Guess who he worked under? Guess who he worked under? He worked for a while under Eli, the priest who heard his mom speak to that birth. And a message came to him, and I'm not going to read this from the text, but it's, it's sad, but it's funny. Sad, but funny. Eli says, I hear someone talking to you. Who is that? Samuel. Samuel's 12 or 13 years old. I can't tell you. Yes, you can. Who is it? I heard the voice again. I can't tell you. Who is it? I want to know. I can't tell you. 
Finally, the Lord said, you can tell him, you can tell Eli who's talking to him, Samuel. So he said, it's the Lord talking to me, Eli. And what's he saying? What's he saying? He's saying, I'm the new priest. <laughs> you need to retire. I'm the new priest. 12, 13 years old. It took a little while. And Eli passed at 98 years old. Can't say he passed quietly. Those Philistines got so bad. You know the story with David with them. So bad that they killed both of Eli's sons, Philistines. They took the ark. And when Eli found that out, and Samuel was still consoling the people, this is before when they had the king, and consoling the people, that Eli fell over dead. Dead. He had enough. He was 98, and now I think he knew Samuel would take over and take care of the people. So out of this backwater town of Zophim, resulting in the birth of Samuel, one of the great linchpins of the nation of Israel, and the faith of Judaism itself continued because true love, true love really does happen. Let us stand together and sing our closing hymn.